Welcome to episode seven of Inside the Chicago Outfit on the VPod Network. I'm James Enzo Forney, the co-creator of the show, and I'm here with my esteemed guests and mobologists. Camille's Robinson, contributing writer. Joey Seifert, co-creator. Paul Whitcomb, contributing writer on Inside the Chicago Outfit. Today, we're going to talk about Anthony Joseph Accardo. At least that's what it says on his tombstone. And it's appropriate to bring that up because he is the longest running mob boss in the history of mankind. Let's take it all the way back. Where did it all begin? Where's he from? He was born in Chicago, but he, his family was from the far western coast of Sicily, Trapani. It's context, it's about 15 miles from Castellamare Merida Golfo, where Joseph Bonanno's family is from. It's heavy, heavy mafia country there. So they emigrated right before he was born, and he came up in uh, the near west side of Chicago. Yeah, so he, he was born in 06, and how long did he live just to the other end? He lived like... The- 1992. Right. So an incredibly long life and an incredibly long life in the life. Correct. All right. Well, let's let's dig in. What 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 happened with him? What, where did he get his start in uh, the mob life? Oh, his father was a shoemaker. He came up in a regular family, and six brothers and sisters. Early on, though, he decided he was going to stray from that that regular life, and I think he held two legitimate jobs. And after that, he began making his way in the streets. He was a thug. He was a, a thief. And the earliest we know about his criminal background is he began hanging around with some of the the known Sicilian uh, thugs of the time, especially uh, Vincent Mora, machine gun Jack McGurn. And the central headquarters uh, was the Circus Cafe. And that was where the outfit, they were basically criminal mercenaries, the Circus Cafe gang. And there was Tough Tony Capizio, Claude Maddox, and machine, gun, machine Gun Jack McGurn. They were the Chicago equivalent of Murder Incorporated that you would see in New York. And so this is, a, you know, I think probably the first time for people outside of uh, the, you know, serious mob historians. The Circus Cafe Gang, what do we know about that, Paul? Where, where, did, where did that come from? What, what, what is the actual Circus Cafe? Well, as Camilla has pointed out, the, 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 this was Chicago's version of Murder, Inc. These were serious killers. Uh, Machine Gun Jack McGurn, uh, Vincent DeMora, Claude Maddox, Tough Tony Capizio, huge names. Uh, Tony Capizio would be... Uh, a Cardo's mentor for many years. As a matter of fact, in the 50s, when tough Tony finally died of heart problems, a Cardo would take over his crew and just absorb it. Uh, and he learned from these three men. There was actually a circus cafe that they would hang out in between jobs, and that's where they got their name. So <clears throat> naturally, Capone used the circus cafe for really heavy work, and we're going to talk about some of the heaviest work in, in mall mob history that was handled by these people. But Tony Accardo came into their orbit and through machine gun Jack McGurn was introduced to another young mobster by the name of Al Capone. So Capone, okay, starts to enlist Tony Accardo. And why does he do that? Why does he favor Accardo? And what does he have him do? Accardo is known as a heavy. Now this is the the early 20s. Accardo is only 20 years old. It's 1926. He's five foot nine inches tall and 200 pounds. He's built like a gorilla. And, and 100 years ago, that's a very substantial size person. Mm-hmm. And Accardo was very athletic, very strong, and he was known for his physical prowess. So machine gun Jack McGurn takes him into Capone and says, look, we're in the middle of this war with the North Siders. We need muscle. This kid Accardo can handle himself real well. Capone says, look, Accardo, McGurn trusts you, so I'm going to trust you. Therefore, I make you... If you mess up, it's not only your ass, it's his. Do you understand me? Mm-hmm. And he's made just like that at 20 years old. Wow. That's a fast ride. <laughs> it's a real fast yeah, ride. Impressive. He had to be tough right from the get-go. And it and really was a sign right. for his longevity. Like, he, he knew how to play the game right from the, from the beginning. Right from the beginning. And he starts by sitting in the lobby of the Lexington Hotel, which is Capone's headquarters, and, and where was the Lexington Hotel? On South Michigan, right there in front of everything. Capone was not low-key. So he's right there on the main artery of America's second city, operating. Tony Accardo and some other famous names like Sam Giancana and others, 
sat outside of Capone's suite with a Tommy gun on his lap, covered by the Chicago Tribune's Chicago Daily News, just to protect Capone during his daily business. And that's how he got his start. Wow, just almost like a, like security for, for yes. Capone. Yeah, just organized security. It's, what's interesting about that story, too, is, is when you look at New York and the formal ceremonies and, and the knife and, and the pistol drawing the blood and burning the saints, uh, in Chicago, Accardo goes before Capone. Capone says, all right, you're a member, you're a made guy, you're with me, I trust you. And that's really the beginning of the more informal sense of, of Chicago, you're with us, they would go out to dinner or something. And even that early on, and that would, that would continue through the, through the 80s and 90s, there was some, some uh, stepping away from that, but not really. And Chicago didn't really have much use for that more formal ceremony that, that you would see in other cities. And, and that, that story is a prime example of that. And Ricardo, who was a Sicilian and who would come up, even, even he didn't, didn't really care for that more Sicilian ceremonial making and, and, and welcome to the Brotherhood sort of, sort of what they considered to be nonsense. Well, it also speaks to the businesslike and, acumen and attitude of the Chicago outfit. And if you think about it, Capone was putting into place what is now a function that we see around the president of the United States, which is like a secret service function. I'm right. gonna have, uh, I'm gonna send out hits on other people, but I'm gonna have my own protection in case of things. And I'm also gonna have my own armored car. All of this predating when any of that happened, you know, for our, for the you know, people at the highest office in the government, he was doing it already in the 20s. And right? not only was he doing it, but after Capone was sent to prison, Franklin Roosevelt used Capone's armored car as the first armored limousine for the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. Once again, we lead the way with innovation. We've <laughs> 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 heard that and, a couple times. Yes. Yeah, and, yeah. and in fact, there was a, an assassination attempt by the North Siders. Uh, Accardo, being uh, uh, close to Capone, he did pull Capone away from the window. They were dining, and there was a machine gun, sprayed the window. Uh, Accardo, in true Secret Service fashion, threw himself over the body and, and basically used his own body to shield Capone. So it, it, it's really a, a very good comparison. The, uh... Well, also, not only is it a good comparison, imagine what this did for the loyalty yeah, to Tony Accardo to throw yourself, to throw your body in front of, you know, incoming <laughs> gunfire, mm -hmm. right? And was he injured in that, do we know, or no? No, he not survived. That I, it was it was a miss, but nonetheless, right. the gesture I'm sure went well appreciated and by Alphonse. The the fearlessness and, and generally the instinct that that you, you, know, you hear the gunshots and that kind of thing is basically learned. That that's it, there's a lot of instinct there, but that it, it, it comes from being around gunfire and, and knowing what to do. But right? if you're at that point that you're reacting that quickly in the face of that level of violence and that level and that fast in attack, a machine gun attack, it, it, it comes on pretty quickly. I imagine he had experienced it. He runs towards Right, it, and I imagine saying. he had experienced something along those lines earlier. Let's talk about his work. What's some of the work that he did? Well, he was a typist, and uh, he was about 60 words a minute at that point, which was... <laughs> It's pretty impressive on those days in the old... Uh, <laughs> I guess I should have put quotations around work. <laughs> I think I mean, Yeah, I mean... Uh, well, I, I mean, a different kind of work. The wet work. Chicago but, uh, typewriter. Chicago, Chicago typewriter. Chicago typewriter. Yeah. Anyway, I'm like, wait a so, minute. You pick up the typewriter and use it uh, uh, over someone's head. Um, they were heavy back then. So. It, it, in addition to wielding a Tommy gun, what else would he wield? Well, this is a great story that is something that stayed with him for the rest of his life. But they were, uh, Al Capone had been put in jail for a while. And while he was gone, a couple of his heavy hitters, Scalise and Anselmi, started talking about how they were gonna take over the rackets from Al. Of course, the other people reported this back to Capone. So in typical Capone fashion, he throws a big banquet to honor Scalise and Anselmi. And at the end of it, is bad news for Scalise and Anselmi. Tony Accardo takes a baseball bat and beats both men to death right in their plate of pasta. And Al Capone says, famously, that kid's a real Joel Batters. And that name stuck with him for the rest of his life. His, his friends, till the day that he died, called him Joel. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, Joe Banners. Yeah. That was the name of Stuck, right? Right. I mean, it's interesting, you know, you think of how much Hollywood had co-opted uh, mafia stories in different ways, and De Palma picks up on this and miscasts the whole situation with uh, De Niro playing Capone, and De Niro wields, right. uh, in Capone's uh, uh, character, wields the bat. It wasn't Capone, it was Accardo. Yeah. That's what I believe to be the case. Not that Capone wasn't fully capable of that violence. He certainly was. But this time, it was Joe Batters. Right. That's, that's the real story. So now you all know. Uh, okay, so now he's Joe Batters. And, and what else does he go on to do? Well, he, he, I, what, I think that it's interesting to know that we all know him as Tony Accardo. And, and you see people talk about Tony Accardo. But in his life, he wasn't known as Tony Accardo. And, and maybe in the newspapers and all. But in the criminal world, he was Joe, period. It was, it was entirely Joe. And it's only after the fact, I guess, people see... Anthony Accardo, and so he has come to be known as Tony Accardo, but that was never, never what he was referred to in among his peers. Uh, his wife even, I uh, believe, called him Joe, and she said that's what he had always been known as. So uh, while we know him as Tony Accardo today, that was not his name throughout his life. It was Joe. Correct. People know him as Joe. Joe or like, right, we, we have JB. a Joe here. Yeah, we have he, a went, Joe. he tried to legitimize himself in the gambling world. He, he asked his men to call him JB. He thought that that would be more distinctive. and uh, So he could get into the good country right. clubs. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you, it's hard to get in the, <laughs> a good club with a name like Joe Batters. Right. right. Uh, okay. So uh, let's, let's move from there. So he's, he's built skills in uh, hurting people and killing people, where else does that get leveraged? He, 1929, there was a national mob meeting. All, all the, the major mob figures in the country go to, and this is portrayed in, in the show Boardwalk Empire, all of the, all over the country, they come to Atlantic City to, to discuss how crime is moving forward. And interestingly, you don't see a lot of the older figures there. There were some older uh, what they would call mustaches, and they were not invited. Characters like Joe Mazzaria in New York and Salvatore Maranzano, they they did not come. This was sort of a sign of of the changing of the guard. And Cardo accompanies Capone, which would later serve him well. He makes a lot of contacts with a lot of the up and comers, a lot of the young guys, like uh, Lucky Luciano and some of the other figures. So while there. Cardo, the young man that he is, is walking the boardwalk and he sees a tattoo parlor and he tattoos a large dove on his hand such that when he closes it into a fist, the, the bird wings flap. And uh, he shows it to Capone. He's kind of proud. You know, you get your first tattoo. Capone says, you're going to regret that. Your whole, you might as well tattoo thief on yourself. It was, uh, I, what, Paul knows the exact the exact words, but it was something to that to that effect. And it's, you know, I, I, I think that that was a good point. And uh, uh, a tattoo at that time, I mean... It's a little different, right? I mean, it's a different time. This, yeah. is, this is 90 years ago. No, 100 years ago now. Uh, that's not, it's not, tattoos aren't what they are today. Right. I mean, it wasn't unusual that people got tattoos, but it was unusual that the outfit people were getting tattoos. That's more like a Russian thing, no? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. especially on, like you said, on your hand, yeah. of all places. Like the Japanese Yakuza, they get them all over. Yeah, but again, they're only uh, where they're covered by absolutely. Your clothes. You know, they weren't where you can, where they'd stick up behind sleeves and stuff like that, and or especially the, on your hand. And he was shy about it over the years. You don't see many photographs of it. You only catch it in photographs of of him with his family, for example. Uh, where you'll see his hand if he's if he's cooking or something like that. But in most public photographs, it's not something you'll be able to spot. So, so he had to make an effort to cloak it. He didn't right. want people to see that. That's, a, yeah, again, so, part of his mastery over his public image. So in, in, in the end, it seems Capone was right. It wasn't something that... Uh, it was something that he tried to live down for the rest of his life. He might as well have had thief tattooed, because when you become the head mob boss and you've got your hand tattooed, it does stand out. Um, what's interested me at, at this point, he's traveling around the country with Capone, and we did Sam Giancana. Uh, you see, Accardo was raised by a family in a family environment. And while he did take the criminal route, he went toward a, he took a more circuitous route. He hung out with the older guard, men who were close to Capone, and made his introduction directly to Capone 
very early on. Whereas a figure like Giancana came from a more broken family. He experienced a lot of death and a lot of tragedy, and his father was a very vicious man. And he stuck more with his peers and built that power base in that way. So when he came up, he had a lot of young, the young guard behind him, and Accardo represented a lot of the older power base. And it was a diverging path that the two men took that always interested me. And you know, they did come together and, and have their, and, and seem to work well with each other, despite what a lot of people think. But they did come up in a different fashion, and their leadership, leadership styles seemed to work. But Cardo did to take the more traditional at that time pathway where you, where you ingratiate yourself with older uh, members and then work your way in that way. And Sam Giancana basically punched his way in with the younger, with the young Turks. Well, yeah, and, and <clears throat> for those of you who haven't seen episodes one through three of uh, Inside the Chicago Outfit about Giancana, you can learn more about him in those episodes. But uh, the point I think we're making here is Accardo's style was ultimately built to last. Giancana's was like Icarus, flew too close to the sun too many times and right. caught, they, caught up with him. They learned different lessons from Capone, I think, yes. Whereas uh, uh, Giancana emulated Capone coming from, from nothing and he wanted to show that he had achieved and wanted to, and he was going to show the world he was the mob boss, he was the man of power. And Accardo learned that that draws deadly attention to yourself and, and really ends in ruin. And he kept his head down and, and did not want that attention. Yes. His advice caught on tape many, many times to his underlings was exactly what Camillus just said. Mm -hmm. Keep your head down. Keep your head down. While Giancana was dating starlets and, and wearing these thousand dollar suits and flying all over the country and being flashy and hanging out with Frank Sinatra, you never will see a photograph of a Cardo with Frank Sinatra. Keep your head down. Uh, Accardo's uh, archive is surprisingly slim compared to for, for a person who was, you know, as round, around as long as he was, it's, it's much more difficult to find content around him. And he, he knew that. And he was ultimately right because when you look at the tradition of Giancana and then on to Spilatro, those that really raised themselves up in the public consciousness had a really hard crash on the way down and ultimately helped to bring the outfit down. Accardo's model was, was the right model in right. terms of his uh, strategy, if you want to call it that. So uh, what were some of the difficult challenges he, he had to face then early on? In the, in, the, in the time of Capone, we're talking about prohibition, we're talking about you know, rum running, we're talking about speakeasies, we're talking about you know, the proliferation of activities really that expanded with, with the underground. So what did he have to do? He stuck with gambling more or less through his own, throughout throughout his career. As, 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 that seems to be right, Paul, that right, correct? He was, gambling was where he staked his claim, but prior to that, he was, he made his way up through, through, through murder and, and through strong arm. And one event in particular would come to define uh, who Accardo would be thought of for the remainder of, of his life and, and the role he played in the Valentine's Day Massacre and just how much, what, what part he played, this, whether the Circle Cafe was involved and whether he was actually a shooter or what. Uh, uh, but Accardo is considered to be one of the gunmen in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. There's certainly uh, rumors that he was seen later on at the Lexington Hotel holding a Tommy gun. Uh, it, it, that may or may not have been specifically the case, but certainly tough Tony Capizio, his, his mentor, was injured in an explosion trying to destroy the car that was used in the, in the shooting a short distance from, from where the shooting took place. It was cutting up the car in a garage and, and the acetylene tank exploded and, and burned him badly. Mm -hmm. And it was believed to be planned by Jack McGurn. Capone was in Florida at the time it took place. And Accardo is generally believed to be one of the shooters. He was pretty good with a, with a Tommy gun, and he would have been in a prime position to be one of the shooters. He was, he was a man you would go to for that level of, of violence. And so we can safely say that he was involved in some capacity with the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. So for the viewers, let's give them a quick breakdown. A lot of people know the name, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, but they don't necessarily know the entire situation around it. Obviously, people who study the mob know it, but 
why was this such a pivotal event? This is, um, I, I, I'm going to say it, it was it, it is like a, a mob uh, Hiroshima. I mean, this was a really explosive, uh, uh, history-changing event, uh, and 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 horrific. Not not on that scale, but but symbolically, it was. So, what happened? Why why did it happen? Well, it's internecine war. Capone controlled the bootlegging on the south side. He took out the terrible Jennas, absorbed theirs, and then there were the Irish on the north side. And they were constantly at war. They were hijacking each other's liquor shipments. They were shooting each other. They were bombing each other. They were literally at war with each other for control over the, the alcohol trade. So the gangland war of Chicago that was depicted in Hollywood at that time, and, and those people that, that know about it, and later, and then the untouchables and so forth, it, that there was a time when the Irish mob and the Italian mob were vying, really, for control. There wasn't a just the Chicago outfit. There was really almost like two mobs, right, fighting there, each other. There were, there were many mobs. There were probably a dozen or more. Uh, the Jennas, the Capones, uh, the, the, the Northsiders started to get whittled away. You know, Schemer Drucci falls. Jaime Weiss falls on the steps of uh, Holy Name Cathedral. Uh, you can still see the chips the in the marble steps to this day. The are still there. Uh, and, and so finally we come to this, Capone's going to put an end to it. He wants to get Bugs Moran, who is the last standing Irish mafia leader. And so he sets up this incredible uh, assassination attempt where they dress as police officers, they paint a Cadillac sedan, which was what was used by detectives in that day, is as strange as that seems. Uh, they paint it up as a police car and they pull up and they march into the garage expecting Bugs Moran to be there. Well, he was late, but seven others were there and they line them up against the wall and machine gun them, all dressed as police officers. So, and there's a little bit of history that, that Joe knows that I don't think a lot of people know about a photograph. Yeah. I uh, went to my uh, mom's one day, and she had a small little pile of stuff as she did through the years and said, that's some stuff you can, you can have that if you want. And on top of it was a small you know, yellow envelope. So I opened it up and then pull out the picture and it's a normal size picture and it's uh, the St. Valentine's Day massacre. But it's at a, a different angle that I've never seen before. So she says, well, there's something else in there. So I, I pull out this little, it's like that tissue paper or something and pull out and it's an original <laughs> negative for the picture. So I asked where, you know, where'd you get this? She's like, oh, your father brought it home. I don't, I don't know. If you want it, you can have it. If not, throw it away. Okay, so, so that's, I kept it. <laughs> that's pretty amazing. I mean, I think it also represents that the outfit took care of these kinds of mementos because it meant something to them. This was this was a rite of passage that your father was given this negative for a reason for something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, when I looked at it at first, uh, when you showed it to me, it, it, it was startling enough that you had a negative. First of all, from that era. That's what I was surprised about. The negative. I wasn't mm -hmm. really. I wasn't really shocked about the picture itself. Mm -hmm. I was surprised with the negative. Mm -hmm. I mean, the good thing about negatives is, unlike digital content, they will last. You know, if they're yeah. taken care of, um, and obviously your mom took care of them. But then, when you say this doesn't match, because you can go on any search engine. That's the <laughs> first thing it. I did. Yes, yeah. and you go on. Yeah. You cannot find the yeah. photo that Joe has, which means it was taken by somebody for a reason. It was taken by someone that an angle that was for a documentation for Capone. Mm -hmm. Before so, everybody else showed up. So right. not yeah. only did they set up this massacre, but they had someone waiting Absolutely. to record it. Mm -hmm. And you know, with Capone in Florida at the time, he would have wanted some sort of verification. It, it clearly would have been in the newspaper, but you call your own newspaper man or you call your own photographer to come out and, and shoot it. And it would have had to be closed because that, that amount of noise would have raised the alarm quite a, quite quickly. So if you've got your guy a block away down the street, and you say, listen, as soon as you see our guys leave, run in there, snap a picture, and then get yourself out. But they also did post the pictures they took, right, back then? Yes. Mm -hmm. So it was not like he wasn't going to see a fight. Right. That he wanted his own proof. Yeah, yeah. he wanted his Absolutely. own. Yeah, and, and, and probably uh, it's like the totemic. I told him, like, I, I have this mm -hmm. forever now. This is my picture. No one else has this one of what we did. Right. And that's a piece of history that I've never heard before 
I don't think anyone's no. heard before Joe just shared that here. Yeah. That there was a photographer. Yeah, that, that's un, unbelievable. And now, okay, they, they take out seven people. And, and what did that mean? What did it mean for the, for the gangland wars then? That was it for the Northsiders. They had, there were basically four individual leaders at one point. It's sort of the, the leadership ticked down. There was Dan Abanian, who was killed in his flower shop in 1924. There was Vincent Scamardrucci. There was uh, Jaime Weiss. And George Bugs Moran was, was the last man standing. And once his, the remnants of his gang were wiped out, he really had nothing. He, he didn't have the criminal ability to fight Capone anymore. Capone had, had consolidated basically every, everyone. And in his later years in desperation, he was more or less a broken man. He, he resorted to, to bank robbery and, and ended up in prison and, and was destitute when he came out and was no longer the, uh, he, he was a warlord when he went in and, and, and a, a chieftain. He was at the height of his power. He was, he was on, almost on the level of a Capone at one point. And when he came out, he was, he was completely broken. There's, there's no pension plan. So he was, he was, he died penniless and, and alone, basically. Mm -hmm. So he conceded. Correct. We can say that Northside conceded. It's now all the Chicago outfit. It is Capone's. The famous guns. quote was by, by Moran was, only Capone kills like that. Right. Which was true at the time. And, and Camillus is absolutely right. That was the end. And that building's gone, right? Yes. Yeah. There's an empty lot there with three trees. Didn't, didn't they... Take that wall, though? Didn't yes, it's right. still in the Las Vegas Mob right. Museum. Yeah, Some, heard that. Uh, they took just that wall, they took it apart and set yeah. it out and a put Canadian, it back A Canadian had bought it and had it, if I'm recalling correctly, a Canadian had had it in a museum, and then the Mob Museum ended up with it, so they've got it uh, posted. They, they've got it, they've put it up at the Mob Museum in Las Vegas. Originally, you could put your fingers in the bullet holes, yeah. but now it's behind plexiglass, yeah. which is unfortunate, but you could actually touch it at one point. Mm. Right. So, but you can still see the bullet holes. I would you imagine. sure can. Yeah. 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 Sure can. Okay. Prior. Reason to go to Las Vegas. Absolutely. Go see the Mob Museum. Absolutely. This is uh, twenty nine. Yes. Mm. This is the turning point, and now the consolidation, right, of the Chicago outfit is, is now imminent. It's going to happen, and Ocardo is going to have a feature in that. So, what what happens next? Well, it's important to point out that there are a lot of theories about who the Gunners were at the St. Valentine's mm -hmm. Day massacre. Fred Killer Burke certainly right. was one. They they imported people from St. Louis, Egan's Rats, to mm -hmm. to commit this, um, and they found the Tommy gun. The one of the Tommy guns that was actually used was at Killer Burke's uh, Michigan farm. But mm -hmm. Tony Accardo himself, on an FBI over here, admitted to having been one of the gunners. And so it's not speculation as far as I'm concerned. Some yeah. people discount that and say, no, maybe he was sitting across the street or something, but he wasn't. But this was a man who did not have to make things up. Right. Right. And also, maybe this was a point of pride, maybe, you know, for, for him, for his life, because he was there at an a absolutely seminal moment in, right. in mob history. And he probably, you know, would, in certain company, would want them to know that. And, well, you know. sure, he's doing work for... Capone at that time. It was, it was the same Tommy gun. That was one of the same Tommy guns used for Frankie Yale. Yes. Uh, and that was, and we know that uh, Louis Little New York Campagna was there because he called his girlfriend from New York. And so we know that that Tommy gun was in the possession of the upper echelons and, and, and that they, they so certainly Ricardo would have had access. And as Paul said, if, if he's speaking on a wire admitting that he had part in it, it it's not like he was a braggart. And if he's speaking on a wire, we're talking, again, because he had such a long life, this is much later in his Years career having a conversation 60s. about in it. In the 1960s, this yeah. is when all that came out. So if he was talking about it in 1960, he was definitely talking about it in 1930, I would imagine, for sure. in a certain mm -hmm. company. I mean, for a while, I'm sure the heat was incredible around this, right? It was a big investigation, but I don't know what it really yielded, right? Was anybody ever really accused of anything? Well, Burke was certainly Burke. accused, um, but, but not, never not, came anywhere Not indicted, Tony. not convicted. Right. Never came near Tony Accardo, mm -hmm. so he, he was definitely there, and yeah. uh, that was just one of so many things in this man's life that make him so significant in the history of the outfit. And this is the most famous 
mob killing of all time. There was a, another major killing around the time of, of uh, Joey Aiello, who was a, a Sicilian, and there were three machine gun nests. Aiello was a he was the president of the Union Siciliana, which Capone wanted control of that. And for over the course of 10 years, there were nine presidents that were killed by op opposing sides. It was not a position that you really wanted to hold. So Aiello comes out of his apartment building and he's met almost directly by a machine gun nest across the street, two, two machine gun nests. He stumbles into the alleyway and there's a third machine gun nest that catches him in the alleyway and uh, 53 bullet holes raked his body and uh, he, was, he was done for. Now, that was also planned likely by machine gun Machine gun Jack McGurn, I'm struggling. And he was. It's a he tough was, name to say. <laughs> machine gun Jack McGurn, you gotta say he it many times. He was very thorough in his planning, just like with the, the St. Valentine's Day massacre. So the idea that there were multiple people who played roles, it really strengthens the case that Ricardo was there and was probably a part of the Aiello killing also because there would have been a lot of people in place and it, it would have required an. Machine gun, John, machine gun Jack McGurn, he was very close with Sicilians. It was, they, Sicilians tended to stick together, and Accardo was, and he was close to McGurn, so. Right, right. so he's, yeah, so he's, but, yeah. I mean, he's gonna con consolidate his power eventually, right. Accardo, and he's gonna, this is a time when being Sicilian is an advantage, right, in this case, right? Even, I mean, even in Chicago, yeah, there, were, there was a large Sicilian presence, but Accardo knew well enough to stick to the winning team, which was Capone, and sort of veer away from groups like the, the Terrible Jennas, who were the large Sicilian power. Ah, okay, so there was a split there, even, even among the Sicilians with Jenna. What happens in the post-massacre world? What, what, what happens next? Well, Tony Accardo continues to be a major figure. Uh, by 1933, he's listed on the top 10 public enemy list. By the way, that list, that's a top 10 public enemy list. That's not just a top 10 list of mob people, right? It's right. the Chicago Crime Commission, a civilian group that was put together to monitor gangland activity. Virgil Peterson was the president, okay. and uh, Accardo was listed as number seven on that list. Okay. Along with bank robbers Correct. and gangsters. That's what I'm saying. I mean, like, you don't just get on the no. list because you're on the, right, on the mob. Right. There's other people buying exactly. in there and, and yes. doing uh, dastardly deeds. And killing people and robbing and thieving and, and exactly. you know, so it's, you've got to do something to get on this list. You absolutely do. And Capone, of course, goes to prison. We have Frank Nitti, who is his anointed successor. We have Paul Rica, the waiter, mm -hmm. uh, Tony Accardo, Murray Humphreys, uh, and, and a number of others, Little New York Campania, that are old Capone gangsters that continue to wield power. But it's Humphreys, Rica, and Accardo that are forming this extremely important triumvirate of power. As Nitty is running things on the day-to-day -day basis, getting all the attention of the press, but it's Paul Rica who is reaching out to New York and he's making these connections. It's Accardo who's making these connections. It's Humphreys who's setting up the labor racketeering that's going on. Accardo starting his gambling, which as Camilla's pointed out, was his really focusing area. Uh, and, and they're moving towards the Hollywood scandal, which is about to, to strike in the early 40s. And actually, Accardo was very heavily involved in the setup for that. But as is very typical for Tony Accardo, he wasn't touched. But it started off by the murder of Tommy Malloy and a union president who would not bend, committed by Tony Accardo. And what union was uh, Malloy in? That was the motion picture Projection. uh, projectionist. Right. Oh, the projectionist, not projectionist. Right. Okay. So prohibition is going to end. Yes. And uh, even though there's a period of time when they're going to smuggle, uh, you know, still for a while, they're still going to, because people want their, their, their smuggled liquor, that business is going to decline in terms of being an earning for the mob. So they got to come up with other innovative things to do. And so they're gonna infiltrate the unions, they're going to uh, consider other kinds of rackets. They've gotta invent other ways and other means of extortion in order to earn. And Accardo's there at that, that kind of rebirth, if you will, of, of the mob. It wasn't, the mafia wasn't uh, gonna go down just because prohibition ended. That wasn't gonna be the end of them. And, and, and I think some people thought that. I mean, there was certainly editorial and 
uh, discussion. It's like, well, now that you know you can buy liquor legitimately, we don't need these gangs smuggling. That's going to take care of the gangs. Just the opposite. It was a proliferation into a whole bunch of other activities. It was the position of the federal government that the Capone gang went down with prohibition. As a matter of fact, when they were finally forced to deal with it, which we've talked about in previous episodes, the investigation was called the reactivation of the Capone gang. And of course, it hadn't been reactivated. It had never gone away. As a matter of fact, I think that when Al Capone went down, Accardo, Rica, maybe not Nitty as much, they weren't sorry to see him go. Yeah. He had become a lightning rod, much like Sam Giancana would 35 years later. And they were happy to see him go. And there's some speculation that even though they didn't rat on Capone, that they allowed these books and ledgers that led to Capone's seizure to be taken. It was to their advantage to that to happen if they wanted to take over, right? Absolutely. And why would those books have come into anybody's possession unless somebody found a way to get them there? I mean, this is this is something that should have been in a vault under, you know, they talk about the vault where his money was. How many vaults should this have been hidden behind? Right, right. And and there's also certain payments could have been passed along, certain political connections could have been utilized a little bit better. And it's it's almost as though they stepped back and allowed this progression to take place. You know, whether Eddie O'Hare, who was the man who, the lawyer who passed on these uh, ledgers that he, that, he, that he had secreted from Capone's uh, safe, things could have been done after that fact. They, they did have their political connections, but it was almost as though maybe they stepped back and allowed things to just follow their natural course. Whereas uh, for anyone else, Nitty did 18 months. Jake Guzik did about the same. Capone gets 11 years. Now, granted, he was Capone, but had they stepped in, had they made a few payments here or there, they could have mitigated. I mean, after the, after the Hollywood scandal, they got a couple of years, and they involved the attorney general and likely the president, and then they got the attorney general a seat on the Supreme Court. They did really none of that for Capone. Right, there was no effort Correct. to uh, get him freed. They were happy to have him serve out his time. And, well, know. there was some. Was, they, they did bribe a couple of jurors, but the judge was wise to it and swapped juries at yeah. the last minute. Right. But that could have, Camillus is absolutely right. They could have done something more. And they, I think they were glad to let him go. So Cardo is a driving force now, right, mm-hmm. in, in this group. And it's, you called it a triumvirate, so yeah. it's a three, and that's... Let's go over it again. We got Accardo, we got Rika, and who? Humphreys. Humphreys, yeah. So mo- you, you, it, one doesn't sound like the others. Humphreys. That's right. How did Humphreys get in this was, in this thing? First of all, his name ends in an S, not a vowel. So how's, what's he doing? He's here? a Welshman, and he's he's a genius. And I think, you know, Paul and I differ on this, and I, but I definitely think that there was a time when the falling to the wayside of the old Capone gang, and I think that that, that involved. Uh, Nitty in a way now, how late it occurred or, or whatever, or what ex- his exact role was. There's always going to be, you know, a difference of opinion. And I understand that, you know, I may be in the minority, but Humphreys was a, a genius. He was probably one of the most brilliant people in the mob and, and uh, a kind of a Meyer Lansky figure. But he was he tied into the unions very early, Murray Humphreys. And he, he might as well have been a lawyer for his, for his knowledge of the law. And we know that lawyer that, that mob figures take the Fifth Amendment. That was Murray Humphreys' go from the beginning, and basically he spread that throughout the the nation's mobsters that take the Fifth. You can do this. You can just take the Fifth Amendment. And in fact, in his office, he had on a plaque. I declined to I declined answer. I declined to answer. Yeah, on the grounds, <laughs> the grounds that, that I would impugn myself. Yeah, I'm pune myself. Yeah. <clears throat> so he he told everyone that, and he gets into the unions early on. He had his own gang of of guys, uh, uh, Fred Evans and and Red Barker, and they could get as violent as they needed to, but they could also, if Humphreys could pay you off, then he would just as soon do that. And if you wouldn't take it, then he kidnapped plenty of guys too. Doc Fitchie of the the uh, milk. Uh, milk carriers union, mm-hmm. and he took over rackets. He, he like the milk haulers. That was that was a major union. Everybody got milk. He was getting into all these. He really took over, basically slowly every union in the city, and so labor was. I mean, that was the future out of prohibition, and Murray Humphreys had all the political connections. We think about Gus Alex now, but Murray Humphreys really 
bridged the gap between Jay Guzik, who was the old guard, and uh, Gus Alex. It was really that sort of brain trust. But how, how did Murray Humphreys come into the, the group? How did they, I mean, what was, uh, was there a tipping point where he just got in because he d did something clever or was he embraced? I mean, it, it is interesting to think about this. Stole a truck from Capone. Yeah. And he went ahead of him and said, you know, it, but he was, he talked his way out of Capone so Capone respected him. Now imagine that. Bold I mean, move. He, he <laughs> stole, he hijacked one of Capone's trucks, and what does he wind up with? A job with Capone. Right. right. That's how smart Murray Humphreys was. Eventually, Accardo uh, is going to pull ahead of this triumvirate, but right now he's, he's one of the three. So how do we get from Accardo assuming the role of the capo to where, you know, where he starts here with the three of them? What, what happens? Well, that's an interesting story that there are a few theories about, but the most important part of it is that Paul Rica is behind the scenes anyway, wielding a lot of power. Frank Nitti is the one you see on the Untouchables. He's the one that was in the newspaper. He's the one that actually the Chicago police tried to assassinate, uh, resulting in the shooting of, of Mayor Cermak in Florida. But Paul Rica, Tony Accardo and Murray Humphreys are the ones that are building these rackets, that are reaching to labor, that are doing the, the, the call girls, the, 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 uh, the gambling. They are the ones building all this. Now, Sam Giancana is in prison right now. So the number four of these men is not available right now. So these three are doing their schemes, one of which is the Hollywood extortion scandal. Early 40s, this all blows up. We talked about it in episodes four and five. Correct. Uh, the, the Hollywood movie extortion scandal. And everybody gets swept up. Paul Rica, Little New York, uh, even Frankie Diamond Maritoni gets swept up, leaving one man standing. That's Tony Accardo. Right. Murray Humphreys is then released from prison. He avoided because he was in prison. And he's there to help Tony Accardo. And Tony Accardo becomes the acting boss of the outfit in 1943. So he, he really takes the reins in 43. From 43 until the time of his death, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would you say, what would you say he was in, in control most of the time? I mean, there's other people, Cerrone, Ayupa, there's other people we get to down the road, but I mean, I'd wasn't he, he a consistent presence the, the yeah. entire time, right? Had his finger on the pulse, absolutely. If he, if he wasn't the absolute and all be all, especially towards his older age. And I don't even know that, the, I think that he was probably reluctant in that role. There were a lot of times that he, he probably would have liked to step back. In the 70s, you had, you know, Giancana go down. So he, and there was, you know, in the 60s, and Giancana goes down, so Ocardo had to step up. And then you had Milwaukee, and then you had Sam Battaglia. He goes to prison, uh, Ocardo had to step back up. Uh, Jackie Cerrone goes to prison, he had to come back. You had uh, Milwaukee Phil dies. He has to step back into the role. Milwaukee Phil Aldericio. Milwaukee Phil Aldericio dies. And you have a whole bunch of the, the leadership dies in the 70s. All the older guys die. So, And then you have the straw man uh, where the, the skim the in straw Las man Vegas. The straw man Operation straw man, correct. Yeah. When all of the... When the Las Vegas skim is brought and all of the Midwestern bosses from Kansas City, uh, 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 Wisconsin, and... Cleveland and Chicago were this is all 82 going down now. In 82. Fast forwarding all the way up there. Correct. Yeah. And so Accardo is brought back into the mix and has to help guide a new generation of leadership. So I think that it wasn't so much that he always wanted to or that he was power mad or greedy. I just think that he had real, a real sense of loyalty to his operation and he had to keep stepping back and guiding the and guiding a younger generation. So he kept it's kind of like um, uh, Pacino in The Godfather Part Three is just like, when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. And he really kept getting drawn back in because of his knowledge and because of his connections. They, they needed him. He was the steady hand. Right? Correct. He yeah. was the steady yeah. hand on the till. And from 43 to 57, he was absolute boss. Mm -hmm. From 57 to 66, Giancana's out front. We had a series of then what we would call street bosses. Uh, in the early 70s, it's, it, it, Cardo gets pulled back in. He brings in Gus Alex and Joey Aupa, who by no means is as nearly as sharp 
Uh, this man is extremely smart. Paul Rika's most famous contribution to the lore was his statement that Tony Accardo had more brains at breakfast than Capone had all day. Right. And from 43 to 1992, he remained the man who ultimately decisions had to be cleared through right up until the days of Sam Carlisi and, and John DeFranzo in, in the early 90s when he was a very sickly old man. When they had a dispute, there are photographs out there of this actually that was caught by the FBI. They called in Tony Cardell to settle it. Right. He was the go-to. He was the go-to. Mm -hmm. There's really no comparable figure in the Cosa Nostra. There's no. no comparable figure in American history that, that has that long of a run. Even his, his condensed figure of what you called absolute power from 43 to 57 is a long run in, to, to most bosses, just right there. But the fact that, as you said, he, he was continuously pulled back in. If, and if for no other reason, that, that there were figures who may have been comparable in their, in their longevity, but he, he, they tended to die. They had, had heart attacks and he was a very rich diet. <laughs> But uh, they would die. Uh, somebody like Carlo Gambino, who certainly had the respect in a large family, he died in 72 of, of, of heart problems. Uh, uh, Joe Bonanno was alive, but because of his machinations and, and different uh, problems, he was kicked out of his family and, and lost all respect in, in, the, in the mob world. So really, there was nobody who maintained and stayed and, and lived as long as Ricardo and stayed within his own organization, Borgata, or family, whatever word you want to use, for as long as Ricardo. There were certainly people who had that level of respect, but just didn't, whether, whether because of power struggles or just dying at a younger age, nobody was around for as long as he was. Well, he is certainly an infinitely fascinating character, and we're going to continue to explore the legend of Joe Banners, Accardo, and future episodes. Stay tuned on Inside the Chicago Outfit on the VPod Network. Thanks for joining us.